This is the Demystifying Mental Toughness Podcast, hosted by David Charlton, and you're listening to this podcast to help you build your own mental toughness, or so that you can support other people or your clients better. Either way, you will learn more about developing this plastic personality trait that all but guarantees that you will perform better and lead a more prosperous life. Hi, this week I had the pleasure of an Olympian's company. That's right, Chris Cook, who performed in two Olympics in the pool, swimming, joined me to share his wisdom. It was great fun recording the episode. Chris has a fountain of knowledge and many helpful experiences to share. We went on to chat about his journey, the obstacles he had to get past, goal setting, great questions that you can ask yourself, and we also look at what a sports performer can learn from a CEO in business too. It's well worth a listen, as there are many, many golden nuggets in this episode. Hi, Chris. It's great to to finally meet you. Um, Would you like just to share with the listeners a little bit about your background? Yeah, thanks for the intro. Um, So my name is Chris Cook. I'm from South Shields, as you can tell from the dodgy accent. Um, And yeah, I'm, I'm a former Olympian, if you like, or my friend always goes mad over that. Like, you're not a former, there's no form or anything. You're always an Olympian. Um, so I went to two Olympic Games, one in 2004, Athens, and one 2008 in Beijing. And I'm still really lucky. You know, I get the occasional chance to work with Team GB, some of the up-and-coming elite athletes coming through who are younger, been mentoring and coaching some of those. And I'm now in the business world doing some business coaching with a whole range of teams from hospitality to IT, you name it. I work with humans with human problems. That's my <laughs> my, my kind of underlying strap line as a coach is I, I work with people who are willing. That's that's kind of my my bag. And I feel very lucky to get up on stages and be able to share my two length story, which is the, about the power of keeping things simple. I know we're gonna get into some of this as we as we trot along. But um but yeah, that's me. That's me in a nutshell, I guess. Right. Well, do you want to share a little bit more about this, the journey to to getting there first in the, in the Olympics? Yeah. So it wasn't a, a smooth road. No, it definitely wasn't. And, you know, as much as I would have loved it to be, I'm grateful it wasn't. That's a weird thing to say that, but genuinely I am. Um, I think the first thing to say, you know, people always say, oh, you know, what's, what was your proudest moment in sport? And I'm like, actually mine came slightly after when I looked back over my career when I was retired and it suddenly hit us that I was the common denominator in it. And that's when I felt a sense of pride. I was like, well, I did that. You know, it was like, I'm only a little lad from Shields, <laughs> you know, striving and pushing and, oh, I've got this far. I wonder if I could get a bit further. And But my journey started in uh, 1988, watching the Olympics on TV. Um, watch Adrian Moorhouse win a gold medal for Great Britain in, in the men's 100 metres breaststroke. And I remember saying to my granddad, oh, that's what I want to do. I want to be, I want to be an Olympic swimmer. and I can't, I'm sure it was him who said it. He said, "Oh, if you dream big and start small, anything's possible." And that that became a bit of a, a bit of a mantra, you know. Was, oh, dream big, start small. And then the question came up: Oh, why should I start? And I joined a swimming club, and before you know it, you start meeting people who have a totally different outlook on life. I was only nine, so I had a lot to learn. Um, met a guy called Ken Nesworthy, a lady called Penny Wilkinson, and before I knew it, they started to put like accountability things in place. You know, you said you'd turn up. And, where are you? You know, the age of 10, 11, 12, and someone's on your back like that, you're like, oh God, I can't let them down. But I started to learn from such a young age, the power of having a mentor and a coach like that, you know, someone who isn't frightened to call you out. Obviously that journey then leads to climbing up a rank. You go from the town competitions, regional competitions, national ones, national then looking over the big fence, which is your international ones. And before I knew it, I was like, Wow, I'm climbing up this ladder here. I'm like fourth in the country. How, how did I get here? And then, you know, once I started stepping on the international stage, I, I standing on podiums because the competition was so strong in the UK when I was going to go on any international teams, I wasn't guaranteed a medal, but I was definitely guaranteed within a reaching shot. I just had to make it land. Um, so by the time I got to Athens 2004, I didn't have a lot of international experience, but I had loads of like hardcore racing every weekend. <laughs> you know, if I stood up, I was racing against the best in the world at a local meet and deeds. Um, and then obviously the end of my career was after the Olympic final in 2008, when I, 
about out after the, after the final. Did fear of failure ever crop crop up for you? Um, yeah, I guess my biggest fear was probably getting to the end of something and not realizing or trying hard enough. That was my biggest fear, and that kind of probably got me up four thirty in the morning. If I'm being honest, because that's you know you get up and you you graft. If you're a swimmer, you graft before the day starts and hard work really kicks in. Um, but yeah, I think I had a bigger fear around getting the end of something and going, oh, I could have done that, but I just didn't push it, you know. And and I think that was the driver for me, the the failure piece. Yeah, there was a couple of moments when I'd stand there and get over anxious because I wanted it too much. But actually, once I got over that, which was quite a reasonably quick fix for me, I realised that the thing that was driving us was laying down my best. Um, and and do you know what? I'm still there this day, David. I'm still there to this day that you know I've I've realised looking back that while swimming was a passion, actually the real passion I have is is laying down my best and looking back and going, oh, that was me. I was brilliant that. And I feel as I can take that everywhere. I, f- I feel quite lucky in that respect. I take that everywhere. You sound like a guy who obviously was a was a goal setter, but then was able to um, follow through with those goals and like. And basically see see through that promises. Whereas you'll, you'll get a lot of people who will procrastinate and mm. put off one day and get overwhelmed by by setting goals. Actually, it's weird, you know, when you say that because naturally I'm I'm not a very good goal setter. And um, so I married a really good one. My wife is fantastic at that. <laughs> she is like target driven, results driven. You know, she's very much like I know where I need to be. It's really clear this, and she'll pave a way. And she's amazing. I've never met anyone like her. To be fair. But when I joined swimming, I wasn't very good at that. And I realized I wasn't. I'm a very, em- I'm an empath. I'm an empathetic person. So I get emotionally involved in things very, very easy. I know who I am. And that's one of my strengths. I know exactly what my limitations are. And what I realized in the process of, of learning to climb the top of sport was I needed to become really great at the stuff I wasn't good at. And one of them was setting goals and targets and breaking them down. So actually, I feel lucky that. Whilst I didn't, I didn't know it at the time, but I was kind of bringing in colourful characters who would go, you're missing this, I think I can help you. You're missing that, I think I've got the solution for you. So from the age of like 10, 11, 12, 13, all the way through those impressionable years, I was learning how to step out of what I was really great at, which was building relationships and rapport. I'm good at that. I do that in my sleep. I wasn't so good at cutting through the nonsense, upsetting people at times and getting what I needed and wanted. I needed to learn to dial that up. Um, yeah, I feel that, that, that's what kind of helps me with me coaching now is I see people stuck in one corner trying to apply the same tool to everything they're doing. And I loosen it up a little bit for them and go, hang on a second, have you, you thought about venturing across to this side? Because this looks like a, the right tool. Maybe we want to have a go. I suppose, yeah, the, the coach's role or the, the psychologist's role, that, that, that's a massive part, isn't it? Just to, mm. to open their eyes and, and shift that, that perspective. Mm. Um, you mentioned the words there. I know who I am. Mm. So wh- when did you, when did that uh, <laughs> come about? Was it in the last couple of years, or was it um, you know when you were competing at Athens and Beijing? Good question. You know, I, I guess I know myself more now, and I'm prouder of myself than I ever was when I was swimming. If I'm honest, um, through the challenges that I've come through, but. I learned to be someone to get to where I needed to be in swimming. And when I came out, that was the, also the start of a chapter of kind of stepping into who I then wanted to morph into. And that, that's certainly not like changing your personality or anything like that. That was about kind of looking at the next challenge and saying, right, what characteristics do I need to meet those demands and and going out there and doing that? But I guess your failures are opportunities to learn what's missing you know, I used to ask that a lot. Um, if I ever got nervous for an event and I got really over, over nervous and fearful, the first question I would ask myself is what's missing? You know, it, the, the feelings of fear and worry, those feelings we get inside are exactly the same as excitement, kind of. But the excited feelings, are, are you saying you're ready? The worried feelings, are you saying you're not ready? And I used to sit there with that and go, right, what am I missing here? Yeah. And who needs to know? So I'd go up my coach. Oh, I'm feeling over nervous here. What's missing? So I've got to learn about myself. But this phase is about implementing that those learnings. You know, I had to implement it really quick in swimming. You have a four-year cycle. If you get it wrong too many times, you don't make it through that cycle successfully. Whereas now, I don't feel like time's against us. 
I've got all the time in the world. So I'm messing up left, right and centre, all sorts. And I'm just owning it. <laughs> and just really liberating. Actually, it's really liberating. Just owning it in that respect. Um, but yeah, I, I don't take myself too seriously. But I went through a patch where I really did, though, <laughs> if I'm honest. <laughs> and it gets in the way. Your ego gets in the way, man. <laughs> I can imagine going share, share a little bit more about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, just little things like, you know, when you get it wrong and you kind of try and cover over cracks or you you tell people, no, 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 it wasn't like that. And you try and overshare your story. And I stop now and I go, yeah, it was. I just own it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, that was me. I was just being a prat, you know. And and it and it what invariably what it does is in that moment, yeah, it shines a spotlight on you and your pratness, but it also sends a message across to other people to go, this person can be wholeheartedly trusted. That's a beautiful gift, that. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful gift in your team and beautiful gift in your relationship, whoever you're with. Essentially, you're showing your vulnerable side, aren't you? Yeah, um, definitely. Mentality. I used to show it in an emotive way, though, if I'm honest. So I used to have this kind of overly exerted outburst of these emotions that came out. Whereas now I've got a lot more control over it. I still have it inside. But I ask myself, like, is this useful or useless? Dead simple. Mm. Is what I'm about to do useful? No, it's not. Then why are you using it? <laughs> and I'm, I'm all about keeping things simple. It's in me coaching. It's in me speaking on stage to teams. I'm like, let's boil this down to a really simple thing. Is what you're doing right now helpful or help making you helpless? And you can see the look on people's faces. Another one I ask is, um, hands up, who's got a to-do list? And people put their hands up like, who's this balls or have I got a to-do list and I'm like, like keep your hands up if you've got a stop doing list <laughs> all hands go down David, every time all hands go down and they look confused and I'm like which one's the most important one right now because <laughs> you're telling me you've got no time but I'm telling you, you don't need a time management course <laughs> how many time management it's the most pathetic thing to go on a time management course who's managed time not one person in history has ever managed time they've managed the tasks they need to do in that time and actually, the question I need to ask before that is, are the tasks I'm about to do in alignment with where I said I'm going to go? Yeah. Yes or no? And often they'll go, Whoa, that's a difficult one, that. No, no, I didn't ask that. I asked yes or no. Black and white. There's no fluffy gray areas. There's no kind of wooliness. Is what you're doing now helping you get there? Yes or no? No. Right. Then it needs to go. <laughs> yeah, it needs to change. But I suppose mm. yeah, a lot of people are just get so, so busy, don't they? And yeah. Oh, the fear gets in the way, the frightened to make changes. Me too. I, like, this is the reason I can talk so eloquently about it because I find myself there daily. <laughs> and, yeah. You know, this is not me saying, oh, I'm enlightened enough, you know, it's to the point where I'm above you. There's no chance of that. I'm saying, oh, I battle this every day. I, I create my list and I look and go, why have I got them five on there? That's not mine. <laughs> get rid, get it out. It is true, and I suppose that's the art of reflection, isn't it? Being mm. able to actually look at that and think, mm, and ask mm. them damn good questions of yourself. I think, uh, right. I think yeah. the, the key is that you've hit the nail on the head there. I think from a young age, you know, in sport, you're taught to reflect constantly. Come out of a race and the coach will go, oh, what happened there? You know, and you'll come out and think, oh, it was a terrible race. And they'll kind of bring you back to all terrible. I remember I came out one race once and I was chucking me, throwing me stuff around and kicking off. The coach went, what's wrong? And I said, that was just a rubbish race. He went, all of it. Well, not all of it, but that bit was. He went, all right, okay, tell me about the bits that weren't. I went, well, the dive is all right. And there's, I guess the, the first 15 metres were good. The turns were a bit ropey. And he went, all ah, right, okay, so we just need to work on turns. I was like, well, turns and a bit of fitness at the back end. He went, all right, that's only two things. You said the whole thing was rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> and in that moment, he's just like, he's just breaking it up, loosening it up a little bit for me to go and reflect properly without this kind of outburst. And that's kind of like, I still have that reaction, but the response is different at the back end now. And I suppose it'll depend on the sport, won't it? So you're, mm. you're lucky in that way where you've, you've had a swimming coach to, to be able to help you. Mm. It was a, I don't know, I work with a fair few golfers or footballers and the footballers where there's well, there's a squad of 15, 20 people, so they're not going to be able to have that conversation. The golfer generally hasn't got the coach with them <laughs> when they've finished a tournament or a, yeah. or a competition. So they're building up all these stories in their head or they're, they're getting, um, I don't know, um, they're getting questioned off other people and they're maybe yeah. not <laughs> not the best way. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, back to, back to yourself, though. Um, I suppose, what would your definition of mental toughness be in when it comes to swimming? I think for me, 
in anyone's line of work, and I'm kind of going to go overarching here, is understand what you need in order to perform. So for you, it might be different than me. We, we might speak the same language and say, oh, yeah, you've got to be resilient. But resilience might mean something totally different to you and me. You know, we might get the same outcome, but we get there a little bit different. So for me, resilience often means um, I, I get a little bit quiet in my thoughts. I really think it out. Other people like have this over outward expression of like emotions. You know, we all act and respond in a different way. I guess my my job as a coach now is to help people understand what, what do we need to put in place for you to perform at your best? And I'm a massive believer that so many people work really, really hard, but they don't recover properly. I think a lot of people escape. They say it's recovery. So they'll go for a big knees up, drinking, you know, have a great weekend and all that. And then they'll come back into work. Oh God, I've never left the place. Oh God. You know, actually really the the big question is, are you recovering? Because 24 hours is a long time if you recover properly. 48, it's even longer. Friday through to Monday should be beautiful if you do it properly. Yeah. And that, that's what I've noticed is like as a, as a former sports person, I've come into the business world and actually the recovery rate that I can push is much higher than what I see other people doing purely and simply because in swimming, we, we had to maximize it every single second. You know, I'd get out of the water from a young age and the coach would say, right, you've done a cracking job tonight. You've had a great session. You've done this, this, and this. Get yourself home, plenty of hydration, good food. I need you rested, ready for Monday morning. See you back 4.30, 5 o'clock. Yeah, you know, yeah. what they were doing is they were going, this is what you've done. And I need to match this with the rest and recovery. Yeah. You know, and, and that's the key is we don't have those conversations enough in business. We usually have them when people have a crash. We normally go, oh, right, it's got too much for them. Yeah, yeah. Does it uh, need to get to that point where people snap and break? It doesn't. We don't do that with sports people. Or, or if they do, it's because it's misjudged, mistimed, or they've been unlucky or whatever's happened in that process. Generally speaking, it's hard work and recovery are side by side. Mm-hmm. Um, but understanding what you need, I think, is ultimately what mental toughness means. Like, what is it you need? To be able to deal with those pressures, essentially. Yeah. 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 As you say, the performing your best. I like that. That's uh, yeah. A great little analogy there. Um, so obviously, yeah, two length mindset is mm. part of your keynote, isn't it? Do yeah. you want to share with the listeners a bit more about that? Yeah. So obviously, um, I got to the top of the sport in 2004. You know, I, I reached a, a high level, but I came back from Athens Olympic Games wanting more. I knew there was something in the tank. That there was more there. I was a bit like, felt like I'd lost the tenner and found a fiver. You know, I felt like I had this fantastic experience. But then I was like, oh, it wasn't quite what I thought it would be when I got here. And so I remember going into a sports psychology session with um, Simon Hartley and um, my coach at the time was a great guy called Ian Oliver. And we worked really hard together, pushing the boundaries. And when when I'd gone at this particular sports psychology session with Simon, I'd walked in like really rough from morning training. I had a weight session to do, which was going to be a two, two, three hour session. And then I had another two hour swim session on the evening. So it was a bit of a beastie week and I had like competitions at the weekend and all these pressures on us because the higher up the chain you go, the more pressure there is. Or as I always say to my clients, you know, new levels bring new devils because they do. As you step up, it brings new demons and devils to your door or can do. And I remember sitting down and Simon was like, you look a bit rough. You're all right. <laughs> I was like, oh God. And I just, I went for it. I just told him, I was like, yeah, I've got this, I've got that, I've got the other. And he was like, for five minutes, I must have just like filled the room with just sheer stress. <laughs> and he went, wow, that's a, that's a lot of stress for somebody who just has to swim two lengths as fast as they can. <laughs> I was like, you are? I was like, are you kidding? And we, you know, I was really triggered by it. I thought, how could you get it so wrong? We've worked together for years now. And I was, I was genuinely upset by it. And anyway, long story short, we ended up exploring it. Because I remember my granddad said it was years ago. If ever you're triggered by something, that's on you, not them. Mm. How many times do you hear people say, oh, oh yeah, but, but it's just the way he said it. No, 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 no. Don't wriggle out of it. You're upset by what he said. Let's explore that because that's what you've got control over. Fair enough. Maybe he's opened his big fat trap and he shouldn't have said it that way and he said it this way and that way. But actually, let's discuss what's really going on, what's triggered you, what's hurt, because that's your growth opportunity there. And if you're brave enough to face it, You've got something beautiful there that you've been gifted. They've they've come into your life for a reason. 
let's work it out. So I'd, I'd followed that advice and I'd gone and started to explore this with Simon. What is this two lengths thing? And we started this project, I guess, with the whole team of, if it doesn't help me swim two lengths to get two lengths faster down the pool, what's the point in getting involved? But it threw into question all sorts of things. Like some things came up like, but we've always done it this way. Or I remember one person saying, but we're in the top seven in the world. Like, you know, we're doing it. And, and I was like, yeah, but are we? So we looked at the whole program and we started asking like simple things. Like, does bench press help me pull? And the, the weights coach would go, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, well, is it don't know? A no or a yes? Well, it's a no until I make it a yes. Okay, so what are we going to replace it with? And those questions started to morph and change the program to the point where we started to bespoke it and not just have this hand me down thing. I mean, how many, how many cultures are hand me down cultures? Swimming's a classic. You know, you join the club, you swim, you do a little bit more than the guy that left it in place and you get a little bit better results. Well, is that really performance? Is that high performance? So it threw into question a lot of things. So, and that's why I feel really, really blessed that we went through this because I feel as though I'd, I'd uncovered this blueprint of keeping it simple and that's the question we asked ourselves all the time is what I'm about to do going to help me swim better from resting recovering going to that wedding on a weekend you know all those sorts of things I would hold it up against this kind of mission this ultimate mission um and I've started to challenge businesses now and it's phenomenal like their one-liners now are just keeping them online so I'm working with companies who come up with their one-liner internally and they stick to it is this going to help us do exit not then let's not get involved and it's transforming the way they interact with each other it's freeing up liberating time so that the actually the important things can speak um because if i'm honest i spent a lot of time on things that were urgent running around trying to urgently do things and i still find myself now when i should be on the important things and the more i have conversations with clients they'll say exactly the same thing yeah you know, yeah it's that, that's Gold, that's that advice that you that your granddad gave you there really mm. is yeah in some ways that's shaped uh, shaped the way you went about your swimming and then mm -hmm. likewise into to mm -hmm. what you do now and in, in, yeah. in some respects and yeah people are as they say they're, they're very easy just to, to to blame others aren't they and shove <laughs> shove those types of conversations yeah. to one side absolutely it, 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 if you look at it through that lens everything then becomes gold or it becomes not yours. And that that's that's the difference is I feel people then start to go, well, actually, if I really take this on board and work on my trigger, I level up, but they stay the same. Yeah. yeah they, they will still go around being bombastic or whatever they are. The idea is not to challenge their attitude on that. You can do if you want to. But the, the, the idea is to go, actually, I'm hurt because of this. And this uncovers another layer of the, the onion. You benefit massively from that. Because we've got to remember, we take us everywhere. So someone asked me, like, you know, what is the one thing you've left swimming with? And I was like, a better person who entered it. Yeah, That's it. And if you truly follow these lessons in life, everything we go through is not a waste of time. It's an opportunity to level up again and level up again, even though it looks like a back step. One question on the, the sports psychology mm. angle there. Was it something that um, you were you know, really keen to take on and work with Simon initially or were you a bit sceptical? Well, how did he go into it? Yeah, it was a good question. I was really interested in it, but I was kind of, um, I guess I was kind of reached a point where I was marched along. <laughs> I remember me coach, you know, all of a sudden, you know, I'd gone to um, the World Student Games in 99. Yeah, 99. I'd gone to the World Student Games and got up on the blocks in a really good position to win a medal. And it just fell apart. It absolutely fell apart. And I remember getting to the race, reaching down to splash myself at the start of the race. What we normally do is they'll blow the whistle and for you to get up onto the blocks to get ready to say, take your marks, go. And I normally lean down, grab a bit of water and splash my body with it to get accustomed to what's the climatized, the water temperature. And it's the last thing I do, or used to do. And then the end the whistle, you get up on the blocks, take your marks and go. I remember reaching down, I couldn't feel my hands. I could not feel the water. I was that nervous. And I and I just knew I was in trouble. And I hit the water and I couldn't feel my arms, couldn't feel my feet. And got out of that race, just totally bombed it. Got out of the race and um, I carried it home on the flight sort of thing. Or in my head, I was devastated. When I got back, Ian Oliver, my coach, was like, 
listen, let's let's face it head on. It's it's okay. It's all right. Like open it up. Let's go. Let's find what's triggered you. So I went along to Simon thinking, oh, it'll be a couple of sessions and I'll be sorted. And, and I was, don't get me wrong, but I just started to lean into a bit more and lean a bit more. And eight years later, I was still there, sat there on a weekly basis, chatting about more as another level. Let's do a bit more. And we went on this. I mean, he was fresh out of university into, into working with elite athletes. So he went, wanted subjects who were willing to take the course and find evidence and all that. And I was the one just going, give me more. I'll go and put it into, into place. And to coin what he said, you know, I, I became really good at taking information and implementing it. That was my talent. And I think that's the key is often we get trapped in that information space where we're just searching more, more, more and more. Instead of taking what we've been given, having a go and then going, was that useful or useless? Yeah. And become a really good implementer. Yeah, I'm sure I read something about like personal development books and how... Mm-hmm. 95% of the population will love reading them, but then there's only about 5% that will actually do something with them. That's it. That's it. And if you look at kind of, I would love to match that up with who actually becomes successful. What's the percentage of successful people? Because I reckon it'll be a similar sort of stat. Mm. So actually, there's, there's, it's there for us. It's all there for us. If you just implement what you know, three quarters of the time, you've got everything you need to at least get you, you, you to the front door. And that's, I think that's crucial is if you're looking for a practical start, just implement what you know and then analyze and go, am I going to do that again? Is there a new, new way to do it? Because you're more experienced at that point. Hmm. Uh, I suppose it's, it's just very easy, isn't it, to keep on hmm. making the same mistakes and uh, yeah. I suppose it'd be frightened to make some changes. Yeah. You've alluded to some of the challenges that the, the business owner or the, the executive may have. Hmm. I'm just wondering... What do you think the like the sports performer, the athlete, can actually learn from the the, the business person, the CEO? That's really good. That I like that. Um, I think there's, there's there's lots of things. I think um definitely managing people. I think um sports performers. I'm, I might be wrong because I haven't worked on the inside of a team as such. As in, like you know, you're in that position. I'm in this position. You're in that position. I'm in this position. You know, I, I was part of a an individual sport still had a massive team element to it, you know, and it was quite eclectic in that that way, but it wasn't like on the pitch sort of thing. And I've heard loads of people stand up and talk about how to get the best out of people. I think sports can learn a lot about businesses in that respect. I think there's some, I think we've got some world-class businesses in the UK. I'm a coach with inside, inside a lot of them and they're just phenomenal places to work. Great cultures, but they've created that. It's not by accident. And, you know, I think there's a lot can be learned from that. Um, and, you know, we're, we're always talking about like, oh, sport to business. But it, I think you've hit the nail on the head. I think sport needs to maybe take a tiptoe across to some of the processes that are in place, some of the commercial thinking that's in business as well, because everyone who's anyone now is being urged to make sure things are cost effective and efficient and energy efficient. I think we can learn a lot cross sectors, completely different sectors. Um, I work a lot in the NHS. There's some phenomenal work ethics there, like mind blowing. We can learn a lot from how they do that. Um, so I'm a massive believer in kind of, I love diversity. I think diversity is one of the richest things you can do with your culture. And um, just bringing new people in from different backgrounds and different social situations just adds something completely wonderful and different and that's what i'm excited for the next 10 years i don't think we've seen the tip of the iceberg yet i think we've maybe only just seen a little bit of it yeah i suppose there's a lot of work uh, going on behind the scenes isn't there with discrimination mm. and, as you say di- diversity so mm. yeah no it'll be it'll be interesting to see yeah, where it all goes definitely um just to, to wrap things up can you mm. can you give three takeaways to, to the listeners based on what we've what we've talked about oh first one is me classic one keep it simple if you've got a problem, the chances are there's been overcomplicated somewhere along the line. You know, where do you want to be? What's the cost of you, that you need to lay down to get it? And what's your will to do it? You know, keep it really simple. I think the second thing to do is to realize is that you are the gold in the journey. So if you're looking for motivation or inspiration, you know, whatever experience you go through in life, you get to take that everywhere, good, bad, or indifferent. You get to be the judge and jury of it all. And I think. The last one is I don't think we should ever underestimate that resilience piece. You know, people are, are talking about all sorts of things these 
days. And you know, resilience seems to be the thing that's been left in the wake. And and I don't leave it in the wake. I, I'm I meet it where it is. You know, we've we've got a choice. We can either sit here and wait for boats to come in, or we can swim out to a few of them if we want our chances. And that involves getting in and getting wet. I say this all the time. I run a learn to swim business and I, I say to the parents, you know, some of the parents come going, oh, you know, they're a little bit apprehensive. And I'm like, in order to learn to swim, you've got to get wet. You know, what I'm really saying in that moment is there's got to be a leap of faith about us, regardless of what age we are. Mm. And that should be a beautiful thing. We don't need to fear it. And we can completely morph and trans- transfer how we see things. Once you start seeing things through a different lens, you feel different about it. I don't care what you say. I, I do. I do it all the time. I see it through a different way. And then all of a sudden I feel different about it. And I think that's the beauty of life. Love it. Nice, nice way to finish that is, Chris. Cool. <laughs> Whereabouts can the, the listeners find you if they, they want to get in touch? Oh, um, I'm on LinkedIn quite active. That's my choice, my preference of platform on LinkedIn. So just search for Chris Coop. You'll see my mush there, my uh, <laughs> my mugshot. Um, I'm on Twitter, Chris Cook GB, um, and my email address is info at chriscookgb.com. Magic. Okay, I'll add them to the show notes. Uh, really, you know, really appreciate your time. Uh, oh, thoroughly enjoyed it. Pleasure. Me too. Thanks for that. Yeah, thank you. Wow. Well, that was fantastic, wasn't it? Chris offered so many bits of advice there, it was untrue. It's a really difficult one to know where to start and how to summarise. So I think what I'll do is I'll just take you back to Chris's granddad's wise words. If ever you're triggered by something, that's on you, not them. And, you know, we can all learn from this. How many times do we react to something that's happened to us? or what someone says to us, and then wish we hadn't done it that way. You know, for example, the swimmer who's told by their coach they could have given more at the start of a race, and then gets the hump. Or the footballer who's criticised by a teammate and goes on to sulk. Or, you know, when our parents try to tell us something, and we get annoyed, and we refuse to listen to them. I bet we've all done that. And some will probably do it each and every day. So. Then what I'd like you to do is, and I'm going to encourage you to make a note. That's right. Get a pen and get a bit of paper out. And let's have a little think about, you know, what does trigger you? Some different situations. And the way to go about this, I would suggest using a simple reflective model created by John Driscoll. It goes, what? And this is where you describe an event or a situation that you have been triggered. Then it goes, so what? So you go on to explain why that action or the situation or event was significant. And then lastly, it's now what? And this is where you use future information to guide you moving forwards. So that's right. It sounds ever so simple. It's so what? And now what? It's a really helpful reflective model. And it's very effective in just taking the emotion out of the situation that you're going through. So basically, it can go on to to make a big difference in your life or your situation should you use this model and process on a regular basis. And in mental toughness terms, it's going to help you improve on your learning orientation, a key element of mental toughness. So essentially, you're going to learn from past mistakes or events. And In terms of learning, if you're a parent, you may also be interested in some advice that I offer on a weekly basis. That's right. If you check out Conversations with Kids in our freebie section of our website, the three W's dot sport hyphen excellence dot co dot UK, you can then sign up to weekly tips to help guide conversations in an informal way to improve little by little your child's mental strength and resilience. So till next week, where you'll hear from me in a solo episode, have a fantastic time. If you enjoyed this episode of the Demystifying Mental Toughness podcast with David Charlton, do check out my website, sport-excellence.co.uk and my online sports psychology resources. The Sport-Excellence website has essential resources for anyone looking to build their own mental toughness or the mental toughness of their athletes or teams. 
or if you want to achieve peak performance more often or optimal functioning. The Sport Excellence website has everything you need to keep moving forward and thrive. So go on, head over to sport-excellence.co.uk to find out more.